Back in October, um, a student organization invited a couple of speakers on campus um, to do a thing that they called some kind of comedy thing. I'm not really sure what they said. Um, and many students and non-students alike had took issue with these two speakers and thought that they should not be invited. And, uh, and as a result, there were protests. And it was happening right down the hall here, and it got shut down. When I, when I did my PhD work, I studied social movements, I studied revolutions, and uh, social change and conflict. Um, and, and I understand probably as well as anybody um, as a sociologist how words and words that some people say in public and private spaces um, can lead to outcomes that, uh, that we don't really want and that are not good. And, and I understand how disagreements can quickly es escalate, especially when they're really hot topics. So it, it and, and, and at this point in the semester, however, and I also understand how we all have really strong views about certain things. Like everybody has like kind of a, a stopping point. And the things like that, I can't go with. Like I'm okay to go here. I'm all right talking about this. I'm all right if somebody says this, but this right here, whether it's a word or an idea, like that's my hard stop. I'm not going to be able to go for that. So let me show you regarding this uh, event. This was a quote that I just found today taken from an article uh, from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, ignored protesters and experts. Said Penn State ignored the experts. And I don't know, like I, I'm not, not to blow my own horn, but I've been in this business for 40 years. This is what I study. I have a PhD in all of this. I'm probably one of those experts. Nobody consulted me on it. If I asked everybody in the room what you think about this, what do you think? Should Penn State have shut down this event? What should Penn State have done? What's the best thing? I'm sure, maybe not now, but I'm sure at the time when things were happening, everybody would have had some kind of idea, some kind of thought. Maybe you wouldn't have had a lot behind it, but you would have some thought. You'd have an opinion. And many of you have friends and relatives or acquaintances who would have really strong opinions. And so I thought, hey, why don't I call contact Damon Sims, who's the vice president of student affairs? Because, you know, these kinds of things happen, right? And there's somebody at the table you know, when, when, when this, when these, somebody, whoever wrote this article says, the university, the university is a, group, a small group of people. It's a big group of people. I mean, it's a huge institution, but ultimately a small group of people made the decision. And I'm thinking, this is a really complex decision. And these are really very thoughtful people. And they know things that I don't know. And they know things that you don't know. So wouldn't it be a fascinating case study to hear from somebody who's at the table and who's making a decision like that if for no other reason to show us as we go through life that when we see things that go against what we imagine should happen or should be true, when we see those things, we can take a step back before we weigh in on, on them and say, wow, this is probably a hell of a lot more complicated than I could ever possibly imagine it is. So let me be thoughtful before I weigh in on social media or whatever it is, wherever I'm going to weigh in. So with that in mind, I invited Damon to class today and he is here and he and I are going to have a, I'm going to ask him some questions. We're going to talk about this. Then we're going to open it up to you. And then the last part of the class will pivot in a different direction if we have time. So, Damon, welcome to class. Um, freedom of speech really matters. But I don't think that a lot of us really understand what that means. 
And so, um, well, like, can you just define it? Like, what are we talking about? And like, what's like a legal test or something? Like, can you? Yeah. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, freedom of speech really does matter, and it doesn't matter any place more than in a university environment. I think at its very core, the university is about freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. And as a legal construct, it really sort of boils down to the freedom to uh, speak, to write, to uh, share thoughts and opinions freely without fear of consequence or punishment from the government. That's essentially what it's about. When we talk about the First Amendment, we're talking about the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which of course is the, the primary, the overarching law in the country. Uh, and it is a restriction on government authority, which is what is expressed otherwise in the Constitution. So we as a public university become an extension of that. We are government. And when we're making decisions about speech, we're constrained by the, the First Amendment's freedom, which is not absolute, but it's pretty close to absolute in the context of a place like this. Mm -hmm. and, and it really, and, and you say it matters for the government, but it also, you know, at a university, this is, it matters here because without the freedom of speech, you think, you know, like any one person here, we always imagine that the things that we say are okay. It's what that other person is saying that's a problem. And they're thinking the same thing. And so in a classroom anywhere at a university, freedom of speech matters. So where, where does misinformation... Hey, by the way, I should also say you are a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not the university's lawyer. So. Got you, got you. But you are trained as a lawyer. So keep that in mind, everybody, as Damon is talking. So where does misinformation fit into this? Well, you know, we're living in a world that's filled with misinformation, so it's important to understand that it has the same protection uh, that uh, good information has, generally speaking. I mean, there, there are some uh, examples that are exceptions to the rule, uh, but uh, the, the concern that I think the court has always expressed about whether it should protect or not protect uh, false information is that it's kind of a slippery slope argument, which we'll probably return to a couple of times in this conversation. But it's a slippery slope argument in the sense that uh, if, you, if you tell people, you know, false information is not protected, you don't have the freedom to express things that are false, there's gonna be a chilling effect on people. They're gonna be fearful about expressing many things they ought to express, and it's gonna constrain the, the kind of exchange, the free marketplace of ideas that we like to talk about a lot in ways that shouldn't be constrained. And so misinformation is, uh, is protected speech also, uh, generally. How, okay, so how about harmful speech? Well, harmful speech, and you're gonna quickly get to hate speech, of course, it also is protected by the US Constitution. So there are other remedies for harmful speech, but one remedy is not to shut it down. Uh, it again sort of falls into the category of uh, speech that may be harmful to me, may not be harmful to you, and vice versa, and deciding you know, what true harm uh, is that's uh, derived from speech becomes kind of complicated. Uh, and it, you, you uh, are living in a country where for generations now we, we have ascribed to the notion that it is better to uh, maximize the freedom of expression and exchange among us, even if there are other residual harms that occur, because the benefit of that kind of free exchange in a dem democracy is, uh, is central to the purposes of a democracy. And it sort of goes back to when we were talking about the university and how important freedom of speech is in a place like this. If we don't have freedom of thought and expression in the context of a place like this, even expression at times that is very troubling to some of us, uh, then we get into a place where we're starting to threaten the core purpose of, uh, of, of, of the academy, of a university, in terms of advancing knowledge, discovering new truths that happens by the free exchange among us of, of varying thoughts and opinions, many of which uh, are quite disparate from one another and uh, sometimes can cause ill effects for some of us and, and worse than that. But harmful speech is also protected and hate speech, in mm -hmm. fact, is protected. And, and so what is, what would be sort of the contours of hate speech? 
Well, hate speech generally, and there isn't uh, you know, a, a good definition that the law has, has uh, identified, but hate speech is where speech is directed at, uh, at individuals or groups on the basis generally of race or religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, all the other uh, markers we could think of uh, in a way that is uh, hurtful and hateful. Uh, and for a long time now, especially in the context of universities, there, there have been lots of efforts to try to do something to basically legislate against hate speech, protect people from hate speech. And it goes back to really in the early 80s, there were lots of mm -hmm. speech codes that were created mm -hmm. on college campuses, uh, and those were challenged. Uh, ultimately, they got to the Supreme Court, and consistently the court has struck down any effort to legislate against hate speech by the use of, of, of a code like that. Yeah, so uh, like I wonder, for example, is that, what about hate speech against men or against white people, right, or against straight people? These things that I think there are a lot of people, including people in this class, who, when, who would see hate statements or hateful statements against those three groups or against rich people, right, the 1%. Or Americans or whatever but I think there are a lot of people who just don't see that as hateful they're just like well that's just okay you know that's but man I hear some of the most vile hate directed at white people man that I, I'm just like whoa if you just turn that around and or directed at men or directed at straight people it's like wow it's so hard to see you know when you Especially if you think that you're standing in a space where you're right and you're justified. Um, I just think that's part of a university space here that we're really working with a lot. Um, so can you, um, I, don't, I guess you, maybe you gave an example of this, but just maybe some, a few more examples of the, the kind of the hate speech thing that maybe you come up against as, a, as an administrator or here at Penn State. Do you have any that just come to mind? Well, it happens a lot. I mean, it happens uh, with some regularity, and it has for a long time. Uh, increasingly, these places are becoming more diverse. We want them to be more diverse. And as we bring more diversity into the college campus, we find differences of opinion are more pronounced among us. And of course, as Sam's already mentioned, we're living in a peculiar time in the sense that those differences are differences that we're not navigating very effectively, and the conflicts uh, among them are becoming increasingly apparent. But it really is with some regularity that I and others like me hear about hate speech or uh, behaviors that su suggest hate uh, in, on a college campus. It happens in roommate conflicts sometimes because you're a, assigned a roommate and things may not go well. We've actually had uh, some people claim hate speech in those situations. We've certainly had it in the context a few years ago of uh, an MLK celebration where a speaker who had been invited by the student committee uh, was found to be offensive by the Jewish community or some members of the Jewish community here. And so Sam's right, you know, sort of this free speech for me but not for the yeah. issue yeah. arises a lot here where people find it fairly easy to identify speech that they think is directed at them in a hateful way, a hurtful way, and it, and it seems inconsistent, understandably so, with the university's express purpose of trying to make sure this is an inviting community, a welcoming community, a safe mm -hmm. place. And so I think students and others uh, see that as a conflict that do doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But again, you, you go back to uh, the First Amendment, freedom of speech, that concept, the, the centrality of freedom of thought and expression and university community, the, the, the absolute significance of that, and you weigh that against the, the speech interest, and more often than not, and certainly the courts always would say that the speech interest uh, uh, prevails over the concerns about hate and offensiveness and mm -hmm. hurt and harm. But that's a very hard thing for people to navigate, especially when it feels like uh, that's not what we want to express in a university community. We want this to be mm -hmm. one welcoming place, and yet we're inviting, at times it seems, hate among us by allowing the speech that we don't want to hear to be expressed. But again, like the we don't like to hear, at that, 
everything about this is just troubling to me because we is never we. We is always, and, and I know you agree, we is just, you know, like six people in this room that have a problem with something. And therefore, that entire thing has to be thrown out because six people have a problem. And even those six people can't agree amongst themselves as to what the actual problem is. But, you know, it just, there's always someone that's going to stand up and say, hey, I don't like that. And so then the question becomes, who do you listen to? Like, how do we listen? Do you, I'm, now I want to ask kind of an, a little bit of a politicized question, but maybe not. Let's, so we'll just keep it. What I notice is that conservative students, by and large, they say they feel silenced. And I'm often saying like, and I'm reporting back from talking to so many conservative students over the years, they feel silenced. Because, you know, a place like Penn State leans left, it's more likely that professors or other students are going to be on the left. Um, I think that professors don't impose their will on students as much as a lot of people on the outside think that they do. But, you know, but nonetheless, conservative students are often feel like they get silenced or they can't really speak up. Um, do you have a sense of, could you weigh in on that? Like, what do you hear from your end? I mean, I think it's real. And, and I think that, you know, the, 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 the more liberal students just seem so free to just put their ideas out there. Like, assume, you know, the last class that we did with, with when we talked about Qatar and the Qatari, traditional Qatari approach to homosexuality. And, you know, so many of you were saying, well, but that's their culture and that's okay. And I was really uplifted by that to say like, okay, you see that. Like, you can't just go around imposing your ideas. But could you weigh in on that, this idea of conservative students often being shut down? Yeah, we, we hear that more and more. And Sam's right. There's no denying that uh, a university like this leans left uh, pretty evidently, uh, both among the the faculty and the students, uh, the staff as well quite often, not always. Um, but while it leans that direction, uh, it, it actually ascribes to the notion that uh, we, we want to be welcoming to all and we do not want to stifle the speech of people we may personally or professionally disagree with because of this concept of free and open exchange. We want to be protective of that. And so students, conservative students, uh, I hear from families of conservative mm -hmm, students. Mm -hmm. Their parents will call with this complaint about either a faculty member or some event on campus that caused some uh, discomfort for their son or daughter because it was clearly an expression of a different political view, for instance, about things. And we, we want to make sure that, that those students are heard, that they're, they're understood as much as possible. Uh, we're not going to shut down the speech that they were troubled by. But we also don't want them to feel like they have to silence themselves. This yeah. chilling effect should not exist for anyone in any mm -hmm. dimension of the political spectrum in a place like this. And we need to be conscious of that and, and address it. As Sam said, the, the event on October 24th was sponsored by some of our own students. Uh, those are students here too. And so they represented a very different political perspective from many other students, and yet they have the same rights as all students to express their viewpoints, share their viewpoints in the way that they chose. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes the, the way that gets shared among conservative students is because of just, I think in a, in a way, the way often they get pushed into a corner that sometimes it gets shared by having an event like this where we're just going to be provocative as opposed to saying, okay, we don't need to be provocative. Let's actually have a really thoughtful exchange of ideas. Um, but in part, you know, the, the, it's like a, it's provocative along the lines of free speech. Let's just really test the free speech, which is what happened with this event, right? Let's test the, the limits of free speech at a place like Penn State. Um, and then and it really got tested, but we don't need to go there. Let's really engage. But sometimes we do need to go there because I think a lot of liberal students don't realize how it's like fish with water, right? The fish doesn't understand the fish is in water. And a lot of times liberal students, you know, just make an assumption that it's all that, well, everybody is the way, thinks the way I think, or they should think the way I think about race issues and class issues and gender issues. And, but not everybody thinks that. And so, you know, there's, it's a, 
And not everybody's, not all the liberals are right. It drives me nuts, you know. Okay. Well, could I say, say yeah. one other thing? So uh, one of the important concepts, I think, is that we only have a First Amendment to protect speech we don't like. We don't need a constitutional <laughs> right. protection for the speech we all embrace or the majority embraces. So the, the amendments to the Constitution were really to protect individual rights and in most senses to protect the individuals who are in minoritized groups mm -hmm. because the majority was protected by the other democratic processes in, in essence. So I, I think it's always important to keep, keep that in mind. We, we, we only need the protection to protect minoritized interests and historically freedom of speech in a place like this which goes back to the early 60s, the movement it started at Berkeley, uh, you know, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the, the, it was the liberals, it was the left that was pushing for freedom of speech, yeah. and advocating powerfully yeah. in the same way now that you think the pendulum has swung, interestingly yeah. enough, uh, where the right uh, conservative students are the ones who are trying to defend freedom of speech because I think they see themselves as minoritized in a community like mm -hmm. this. You're right, and the left message is shut it down, right? Tape, tape their mouths shut. Yeah, it's quite, it's very, it's very odd. It's interesting to have been in, the, in, in this business as you and I have for, for so long and to kind of see this pendulum swinging back and forth. Thank you.